I warn you, Admiral, the following podcast will contain spoilers for the movie Star Trek 2. Welcome to Diabolical, the show where four long-suffering friends dissect the film's most dastardly schemes and try to improve them. I'm your host, Adam, and this week's movie is Star Trek 2, Wrath of Khan. So, dear friends... Chats, an endless frontier. These are the ramblings of the podcast Diabolical, its continuing mission to explore strange new schemes, to seek out new laughs and new propositions, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. Let's get diabolical. Greetings and welcome to this week's pod. Joining me, as always, are the panel of peril who will compete at the end of the show to see you can prove the villainous plot of the week and earn the honour of picking next week's film and becoming host. I'm joined this week by Gareth Slade, Ben Steinson and Craig Morris. I'm going to start by asking the panel, in your opinion, what is the best sequel that improves on original film? Uh, do you know what? It's it's just a pity you didn't say best squeakle because Alvin and the Chipmunks <laughs> 2 would definitely win. <laughs> but since that's disqualified, I'm going to have to say <laughs> Evil Dead 2 because it's the oh, best oh, film oh. ever made. So by default, oh, it's the best sequel. Oh, mm. It's definitely better than the first one. Yeah, I remember it being pretty good. I haven't seen it for a good few years. Though. Craig? If I'm just thinking about a film that builds on the premise of the original and then improves upon it in every way for the sequel... I'm going to have to go with Empire Strikes Back. I mean, that's the obvious choice, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's quite a big big tamale right there, isn't it? So It is, and, you know, it's just the truth. <laughs> it is true, yeah. It's, it's... Is it also a hot tamale? Mm, I'd say lukewarm. Lukewarm, but big. <laughs> if I'm going to pick a choice out of left field, I'd say the Bourne Supremacy. Because uh, mm. once Greengrass takes over the Bourne franchise, it's just it's like a completely different prospect. It's really elevated over the first one, which is also good, but in a different way. Good. Then, am I allowed to say Rocky Four? Yes, um... I love that film. It's my favorite Rocky. I think it's superb. Even Drago. It's dreadful. <laughs> Holy shit. All right, can I change it for Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit? <laughs> yes, that's more like it. <laughs> All right. That saved my street cred. Costing a mere $12 million, the Wrath of Khan has been credited with saving the franchise after an underwhelming and confusing big screen debut in 1979's The Motion Picture. Creator Gene Roddenberry was removed to producer and Harv Bennett asserted the studio he could make The Wrath of Khan for a fraction of the $45 million of The Motion Picture, which would have been $184 million in today's money. He understood the sequel needed a villain for Kirk to face off against. His solution was to bring back the excellent Ricardo Montalban to reprise the role from the 1967 the original series episode Space Seed as Khan Noonien Singh. As such, he produced a script which featured Khan and was initially titled The Undiscovered Country. Relative new blood and non-Trekkie, Nicholas Mayer was installed as writer and director in only his second big screen outing as director. Having attended the University of Iowa, home of the Writers' Workshop, award-winning Mayer pulled together the various scripts that had been developed in 12 days to complete his own version, without accepting a single writing credit. The Wrath of Khan featured cinema's first entirely computer-generated sequence, ILM's animation for the demonstration of the effects of the Genesis device on a barren planet. The Wrath of Khan was also a huge box office success and went on to gross $97 million worldwide and broke the world record for its open days taken. It had also been credited with lowering the costs of home ownership of VHS tapes after the studio reduced the release price by 50% to $40 a tape. In world events of 1982, on the 2nd of April, Argentina invades the Falkland Islands, a British overseas territory 
in a failed attempt to prop up their unpopular military junta. Scott Foreman hosts the first documented emoticons, which is, does anybody want to have a guess what show emoticons? Uh, middle finger. Smiley face. Yes, yeah, smiley face and? Uh, the poo, the poo, the poo emoji. <laughs> Ah, uh, no, the face with the monocle looking up. No, Unicorn. no. Ah, oh, the moon, yeah. the moon, the moon looking to the side. <laughs> that's our favourite emoji, but it's not uh, It's not our favourite emoticon. No, it was the smiley face, which is the colon, dash, close brackets, and the sad face, colon, dash, open brackets. Yeah, on the Carnegie Mellon University built-in board system. Sony launches the first consumer compact disc player, CDP-101. 1982 was a peak year for video games, with Miss Pac-Man, Dig Dug, Cubert, and Joust release. Chariots of Fire was the surprise winner of Best Picture at 1982's Academy Awards ceremony. It was the first time in 13 years a British film won the Academy's top honour. Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn won their Best Actor categories, respectively, for On Golden Pond. And, as a special mention for us, uh, Rick Baker won an Oscar for makeup for which film? American Marvel for London. Oh, he's in it. He's been doing his research. Yes, he did. And who, and, and who presented him? Captain James T. Kirk. No. <laughs> no. Vincent Price, the, 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 the king of horror, you could probably say. Hello, Rick. Here's your reward. Please place it in your bathroom. <laughs> It'll be a talking point for your party guests. <laughs> so the first CD player was, what was it, CDP-101? CDP-101. Very close to the Terminator. Yes. Yeah, T- is it the Cyberdyne Systems Model 101? There you go. Maybe maybe it's not a coincidence. Maybe it's Skynet having a bit of a say. And we did warn you. Mm. You forgot to mention, Turner, that 1982, four very significant happenings occurred. Yes. We were born, Adam. We were born. Four storks brought four dorks. <laughs> <laughs> Three dorks and a hunk, thank you. Oh, that's a maybe. <laughs> have you got that written down, have you? Four storks brought four dorks. It just popped in there. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, that is quite, I think I, I dubbed that ad lib of the uh, episode. Well done. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> This week, we are also seeing a return of my wildly, wildly popular segment, Yeah or Meh. Woo! So, for these notable films of 1982, can I have a Yeah or a Meh from the panel, please? We have got Blade Runner. Yeah. 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 Rambo First Blood. Meh. 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 Mm, Meh. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Yeah. Meh. Meh. Yeah. The Dark Crystal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. 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 What the fuck is happening? (laughs) Eli's laughing because he's hearing me going, yeah. (laughs) He's laughing at me. (laughs) I thought we were being haunted. (laughs) He's he's, he's, he's rolling around. He's just rolling around on the floor. (laughs) <laughs> I've been wa- I've been watching the haunting of Hill House, and I'm just scared of everything now. <laughs> Tron, yeah, meh, meh. I mean, actually, I'm I'm yeah in for Tron Legacy, but if Tron didn't exist, Tron Legacy wouldn't. I'd say yeah. When you put on your sequels, then you loser. I forgot oh. about it, yeah, and I've just remembered. Ooh. Tron Legacy is my answer. Do over. We'll, we'll just put that in the start. Can you just like, or take a pause now and you say, my favourite sequel is Tron Legacy. <laughs> my favourite sequel is Tron Legacy. I think the easiest way is just to delete everything we've done and just start again, just to get Tron Legacy in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, start again. <laughs> Last film on Yeah or Mare is E.T. Yeah. yeah. It's a mare for me. You're joking. Crazy. Nope, I just don't like it. I just don't like it. Our listeners will obviously have their own opinions about these and probably favourites of their own we've missed. Yeah, fuck them. <laughs> so you can vent those opinions at us in all the usual social media places at Diabolical Pod. It's an even split today. Half of us are Trekkies, which are myself and Craig, whereas Gaz and Ben are a bit more on the fence, to say the least. 
So I'd like either Gaz or Ben to go first and tell us what they thought of the film. My thoughts on Star Trek are quite entrenched, but I kind of took this as an opportunity to be as open-minded as I could. And if I I couldn't enjoy it, then at least figure out some decent reasons why I've never enjoyed Star Trek. Kind of two things came up for me. A lot of the solutions to the problems that arise are very, very technical, and they require technical answers. And obviously, it's kind of made up technology. So the solutions, the technical, technological solutions necessarily have to be made up as well. And I don't ever find them convincing. And so I find it really hard to suspend disbelief. That was one reason. And this isn't just about this film. It's also about the original series. You do get it in Star Wars as well with the, uh, the power converters, but it's not as prominent as Star Trek. And then the other thing is the pacing. I feel like the original series and this movie in particular the pace is dictated by William Shatner's acting. Or lack thereof. <laughs> Even in moments of tension and you feel it start to build, he delivers a line and brings it all back down again. Yeah. And I found that in the series. I found that in this movie. And so I found it quite difficult to enjoy for the most part. But that said, I, I did enjoy the story itself. Uh, I thought the sets were excellent. I'm surprised to hear you say that it was quite a low budget because I thought the detail really brought the scenes to life. I thought the bad guy was great, and uh, we can go Uh, more into that later. Cool. Craig, uh, let's have a a Trekkie's uh, opinion on this. I am a Trekkie. I've watched all the series, pretty much all the movies, maybe maybe missed a few of the original series movies. I I think, for me, Wrath of Khan is probably a bit overrated. It's usually cited as like the the best Star Mm -hmm. Trek movie, and I don't think it's that, but I think it's enjoyable. I don't agree about Shatner. He's uh, underrated as an actor. I think that he, his line delivery is careful and ponderous, and, and obviously it's quite often parodied. But I, I think that he brings a lot of weight to what he does. I think my issues with the movie were not around pace. It's just I didn't find the the, the whole situation particularly compelling or tense or anything like that. Maybe it's because I kind of knew what was coming. I will say, though, it is a lot better than Star Trek Into Darkness, which is just garbage. The thing with uh, with Will Shatner is I like him in pretty much everything else I've ever seen him in. It's just I don't like him as Captain Kirk. Yeah, it probably... The, the thing is, R- Ricardo Mantelban, obviously, is, is like a really charismatic actor. He, he reminds me of Christopher Lee in, in this, especially. And that probably heightens the feeling that whenever anyone else is on screen, that they might be a bit of a charisma vacuum. but notably in this, I felt Kirstie Alley's performance was bad. It's probably not her fault, though, for reasons we'll probably get into later. But also, Walter Koenig, I I felt he was not good up against Paul Winfield. Gaz, what are your two cents? I've got similar things to say to to you two guys, but Craig mentioned before we started recording my letterbox review, which I didn't remember, so I'm going to start by reading that because it made me laugh. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You made made myself laugh. laugh. Something I wrote made me laugh, (laughs) and I thought I'd share it with everyone to see if it made them laugh. I'm so funny. It says, (laughs) just not my cup of tea, I'm afraid. Oh. Just a bunch of fellas sitting in nice chairs having an argument for two hours. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, i'm guessing sounds from like that, this podcast you, yeah well <laughs> i'm not sitting in a very nice chair though. It's, it's been reconditioned and what i'd what i'd add to that is that's fair enough if if people thought the sets look good and the film looked good for me i thought it looked cheap i thought it looked like a tv show and the acting as well i thought they were cheap tv actors that are just like stand on your fucking mark and say your lines one take and we're done <laughs> mm. particularly like i said Walter koenig i thought was just atrocious shatner i just he's awful in it he really is yeah and fucking scotty jesus christ oh man oh he's the worst <laughs> i was trying not to be too arsy about it but it's just they're such bad actors he's better than simon pegg simon pegg's fucking horrible as scotty yeah, Simon Pegg is dreadful, yeah, yeah. Well, that's fair enough, but Chris Pine and Carla Ban do run rings around Shatner and DeForest Kelly. Yeah. Best thing in it is George Takei's voice. Not his accent, just his silky tones. No, my. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Leonard Nimoy's raised eyebrow at pertinent points. 
He's great. He's good, yeah. Some the, He gets some really good lines in it, which obviously we'll get to later and stuff, but the way he can just raise an eyebrow or look at somebody, and it's and it's the it's the expression, and because obviously he, you know about the Vulcan thing and the lack of emotion and stuff, and just those little movements say so much about the character he's trying to play and stuff. I like the Forest Kelly, and I think that the chemistry between him and Shatner and Nimoy when they're all together is the best thing about these movies. Yeah, they really built upon what wasn't a huge part of the original series, but became really prevalent in the movie series. That's what they tried to focus on, didn't they, with this with this film? They tried to build the relationships, and that's why you see so many little bits with Kirk and Spock, Kirk and Bones, and then Kirk and Dr. Marcus and things like that, and it's all all built around that, that old getting the old team sort of back together again and getting them and bringing, drawing the fans in and making it a bit more emotional because you can imagine being sort of a Star Trek fan in 1982 and hearing this new film's coming out, seeing some trailers in the cinema and stuff to it and thinking, holy shit, at last we're going to get the Star Trek film that we all want and needed. Funny what Gaz was saying about it looking like an episode of a TV show. I think that's what Star Trek fans wanted it to be and that's why it's so popular. Well. They used a lot of the old sets for this, and they used a lot of the old sets and models and things from the first movie. The uniforms they had were like brand new, and then they they decided to keep those going throughout the rest of the the franchise. I think they'd used the, that kind of design and stuff. Yeah, I thought it's a really you know incredible way of turning around a franchise instead of going. They could have gone the opposite way. I think they could have gone the other way and gone. Obviously, we, we've Miss something here, but they didn't. They just went, no. What we're we missing, we're missing, we're missing the heart of the, of the of the franchise of the series. And they, and fortunately, the producer, um, Harv Bennett, he realised that it, what needed was to bring the fans in and draw and get that attention and to bring Montebal and back in as as calm as a stroke of genius. Yeah, for sure. That big reveal of Khan, I could see it was played as this huge moment. It was just totally lost on me. I was like, is that? No idea. <laughs> but the thing is, it's one of those things that all the cinema and every, the old trailers and all the fans knew everything. Everybody knew all about it. They even knew at the end that Spock was going to die. It was, yeah. came out that Spock was going to die and there was like a huge uproar. The fans were going crazy oh, and stuff like that because it was like wow. taking, killing a big, uh, you know, the probably the, you could probably say the second most popular character from Star Trek, killing him off uh, was a big, big risk. But before they'd even k- killed him off, they said they were going to bring him back, more or less. So They had Scotty playing the bagpipes at the funeral. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who actually played those bagpipes? Like the music that, that we hear here? You? It was James Horner who, oh, who yeah, did the score. Yeah. Also done the score for like Willow, uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, I think. and uh, Alien. I think, did he do the score um, for Aliens? He th- I think he might have done, yeah. But he actually played the bagpipes that you, that you hear in that. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Talking about Shatner, and obviously with Gaz and Ben, you both don't like him very much, and I'm I'm pretty much yeah I don't get him. And then obviously you've got the two the two main players are, are really a, a Kirk and um, Khan, and there's no comparison because Khan and Montalban is is just in another league. But I think it, pacing wise, he was on a par with Shatner. He he only delivered his lines ever so slightly mm. quicker. And so I felt like I was just waiting for them. And the conversations between Kirk and Khan were fucking interminable. Fucking George Lucas over here. Hating, <laughs> hating. More intense. Yeah. Intensity, intensity. <laughs> That's what happens when you've lived in Japan for 17 years. You want more intensity. <laughs> <laughs> more intensity. <laughs> <laughs> but funny enough, um, Nicholas May, the director, said about Shatner as an actor, and I quote, was naturally protective of his character and himself, and who performed better over multiple takes, which basically says to me, he's a shit actor and he's an arsehole as well. So. <laughs> Read between the lines. I know one technique that he had was, funnily enough, now, now that we've brought it up, was to do multiple takes until Shatner got bored of trying to deliver a line in a certain way and just did it faster to get it over with. <laughs> so could have been a lot. Worse for you if he hadn't yeah. done that. That's that's true. That that actually happened. Is it? Wow, well, it's a good technique. It's funny that you're talking about this looking cheap though, because I, it's certainly from a visual effects perspective, I think it's it's a massive improvement on the film that 
preceded it. Maybe mm-hmm. you haven't seen that, yeah. so you don't have that comparison to make. But like you said, the uh, the digital sequence is a first, and it looks really good. And I think the worms, the earworm things, look pretty great. Yeah, they were genuinely terrifying. They were really good. There's a horrible scene that. Shame there's that shot of the very good looking slimy worm crawling into what is evidently a paper mache ear. But apart from that, the effects I thought were pretty good. Yeah, I thought it looked I thought it looked good. I I was happy with how it looked. Just the re- the rest of it bored me. Yeah, the nebula effects are are nice, but Yeah. That's uh, that's as far as I'm willing to concede. In like terms of the iconic uniforms that stick around, I think the the wardrobe department did a great job. And uh, I've I made a little note here about why Dr. McCoy's casual clothes, why are they so elaborate? Did Rob Liefeld design them? Because they've got like <laughs> tons of pockets all over them. <laughs> I feel like my character would have many pockets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have anything in them either. He's just walking around. Well, maybe he's got like fags. Just loads of fags. <laughs> While we're on the costumes, what are your thoughts on Khan's outfit? It's uh, It's bold. His moves are very distracting, aren't they? I thought he looked like a Eurovision contestant. Yeah, from from last year. (laughs) (laughs) I guess he had to make his own clothes, right? Because he was uh, stranded. Give me something in the Pocahontas range. (laughs) I have spent seven months capturing and flaying these earworms, and now I have enough earworm skin to make myself an attractive earworm coat. Stuff like that. That's what you got to do. <laughs> but his uh, his chest was pure Montalban, by the way. It wasn't fake. It was it was rumored. <laughs> it, it was rumored that it was a fake chest, but it's pure Ricardo. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It does look fake, doesn't it? <laughs> it does look fake, but no, he's just got that. He's got a good rig. That's how he delivers his lines so powerfully. <laughs> Another little highlight for me is when they did the digital whistle to uh, oh, yeah. welcome Kirk on board when he was doing the inspection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, what was the point in that? that was such bullshit. Well, they had, a, they had an advisor on to try and make everything more grounded. And Ship he was shape. a former naval... Yeah, he was a former naval officer, so he just leaned really heavily into the idea that Starfleet was the Navy in space. So that's where that came from. We're going to need a whistle, but not your average whistle. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the the whole nebula cat and mouse sequence nonsensical i I understand why they did it because obviously in in space you can't really have that kind of pursuit you know there's there's no up there's no down you're not going to miss you know another spacecraft in a dogfight situation it's just not going to happen but I don't think he's going to be thinking in 3D Master <laughs> baggins. <laughs> oh, who's been watching Lord of Rings recently? Yeah, mm. that doesn't make any fucking sense, right? <laughs> That's a throwback as well. And what it is is that on Star Trek original series, Kirk and Spock play 3D chess and it has all these yeah. layers in it. But Khan's meant to be like a, a seasoned military, you know, tactician and he's meant to have a genetically enhanced IQ. And he can't figure out how to have a a fight in space. It's it's bollocks. That's one of my favorite lines. It was only the fact of my genetically engineered intellect that allowed us to survive. Chef's kiss. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but his his intellect may be genetically engineered, but his revenge is Mark I, human. You know, don't forget, wisdom and intelligence are two very different kettles of fish. Yes, that's it. What they say about a salad. Which I might get into later, actually. Oh, okay. teaser! Little, little keep teaser. behind the curtain, there, boys. Very good. Um, I think your plan is going to involve fish somehow. <laughs> <laughs> can we get a few favourite lines off you, then, please, boys? Gaz, can we have a favourite line off you to start things rolling, please? Uh, no, uh, I didn't write any down. <laughs> uh. <laughs> do, you to, do you want me to give you a line and then you can pretend it was yours? <laughs> yeah, you can if you want. <laughs> Could you paraphrase one for us? Just approximate a line, that's fine. Yeah, pa- paraphrase it'll be good. Yeah, go on then. And do you know what? I watched it twice as well. <laughs> I've got a favourite line and I think you'll all enjoy it. And it's when uh, when Kirk is greeting the crew and he comes up to Scotty. So James Doohan had, had been ill. I think he'd had a heart attack or something between the two movies. And 
Kirk asks Scotty how he's been, and he says, had a wee bout, and he yeah. never says of what. So I assume that we're meant to think that he had an STD. So he'd been on shore leave and he picked up some kind of space syphilis or something. Shore leave, shore leave. We got shore leave. <laughs> Is that it? You got any others? Con. I like your delivery. <laughs> I was expecting the delivery of that to be something special based on Con. how iconic it is. But he's like wobbling his lip. Yeah, I, I thought he was on his knees. Yeah, and his teeth like grinding. <laughs> it's like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> Is the truth of that moment better than if he'd practiced and done something that felt less honest? It, it does look like frustration. Whether he's good at mm. portraying that or not is a different question. But I think that that was probably like a, a raw take and not something that he thought about mm. too hard. Whereas when you watch Star Trek Into Darkness, and Quinto delivers the same line. He's got the weight of decades mm-hmm. on him, and I'm thinking he's just he's overthought this. So for me, I prefer the original delivery. Thanks for uh, answering the question that nobody asked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. One of the worst scenes and one of the best lines kind of coincided. The Enterprise had been hit by the Reliant, and uh, I think it was Scotty's nephew or kid's sister, I don't know who he was. He was dying on the table, and he just looks up at Captain Kirk and he goes, Is the word given? <laughs> yeah. And Captain Kirk goes, Aye, warp speed. And then he just hit the guy on the table, just dies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's he asking there? Am I allowed to die, Captain? <laughs> And then there was one more from Shatner as well, where uh, I forget who is one of the crew after they have the, the simulation. Kobayashi Maru. Don't get me started on that, the fucking pronunciation of that. <laughs> they call it Maru. Maru, the Kobayashi Maru. It should be Maru. Yeah. Maru. God damn it. <laughs> it it's, a, it's something they put on all ships here because it means circle. So it means they come full circle. Oh, right. They leave port okay. and come back. Oh, that's interesting. Anyway, the line someone feeds Kirk is what did you think of my performance? And Kirk says, I'm not a drama critic. <laughs> walks on. <laughs> yeah, he's dreadful. <laughs> the original episode that spawned the Wrath of Khan, Spacey, sees Kirk strand Khan and his cohorts on SETI Alpha 5 as an axe of mercy after Khan takes control of the Enterprise in a failed hijack. However, after a global environmental catastrophe on the planet ensues, after six months, killing many of Khan's comrades, film events conspire to end Khan's 15-year exile, and he seeks revenge on the man who put him there. After gaining control of the ship Reliant and learning about the Genesis project, Khan attacks the regular one space station where the device has been developed and slaughters most of Dr. Marcus's team. So what did everybody think of the plan? Not much of a plan, is it? It's more like a reaction. Three florets of broccoli. Three <laughs> florets. That's isn't that equal to? Is that Ace Ventura? It's pretty low. I think it's equal to Demolition Man, maybe. Demolition Man. That's the one. That's the one. When you, when it boils right down to it, what even is his plan? It's just to take a ship and attack another ship, really. Just wants to kill Kirk, doesn't he? Yeah. I will have him. He tasks me and I will have him. You know what I mean? There's no plan. He's just going to have a fight, basically. He's quoting from Moby Dick there as well, isn't he? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, he, he because obviously it's the one, because he found it um, when he was on the original episode, he downloaded all the stuff, didn't he, on, from uh, the Enterprise and was reading all of it. And that's what he was doing over years, wasn't he? And Yeah. He also has a physical copy of the book. They show it at the start. Yeah, there's the start, yeah. But, you know, there's a, another Star Trek character that, quotes Moby Dick in another film, which is... I don't know, is it... Um... Leonard Nimoy in Star Trek Seven: The Whaler's Mission to Mars. <laughs> no, it is it is Patrick Stewart as Captain Jean-Luc Picard in the best Star Trek film, First Contract, in my opinion, anyway. First Contact, even. First Contract? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I correct myself quickly, then. Is that when they're on the holodeck for Worf's 
uh, and uh, Troy's wedding or whatever it is, or is it Riker and Troy's wedding? No, it's the film. First Contact. No, uh, she's not not Ooh. playing games. So. No, but he mentions it in that, so I just thought it was worth mentioning. Khan says about Moby Dick and he quotes lots of Moby Dick. Yeah, anyway, back to the plan. Cut that, whoever it's it. <laughs> <laughs> this episode's only going to be about four minutes. It just be a lot. It just me, me and Craig talking with you two, just going. <sighs> <sighs> Can we actually get you like about fifteen or twenty seconds? Is just you two sighing in different lengths. Basically. It's it's already in there. Trust me. <laughs> I mean the the levels of respect for your picks every time. Just staggering, really, aren't they? Well, I know, I know, but you know, yeah. Team America, I respected wholeheartedly, and the campaign. Yeah, Gaz, Gaz didn't. I've respected every damn film, <laughs> every damn film, even ones I didn't like to begin with. I still had something to say about them, and I respect each and every one of you. Damn it, I may hate you all, but god damn it, I respect you. I said I like the sets. <laughs> <laughs> Gaz, what do you want to say about the plot? Yeah, you know, it's uh. <sighs> Uh, it's um, it's a bit of a lark, isn't it? It's good, really good. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one bit of the plot that saves it and probably stuck in people's minds when they left the cinema, and which is probably the reason it's re- as revered as it is in the Trekkie community, is that Spock's mm-hmm. death scene is like genuinely moving, and it's that for the whole film they treat crew deaths, you know, with respect which is famously what they didn't do on the original series they had the revolving door of disposable red shirt crew members that would just die for the advancement of the plot but in this movie anytime somebody dies you know it's it's a big deal so i like that about it you talk about spock's death scene even when kirk was running to spock he was running really slowly <laughs> a little, little jog and natural pauses in his gait <laughs> yeah it just made me laugh I was like, he's like he's tra- looking panicked and rushed but he was running like a fucking snail's pace I might have an explanation for that when we get to our plan oh how shit was that fight when they when the Enterprise crew beamed down to planet and the two scientists jump them don't they and then Kirk has a little a little dig with a guy <laughs> it's fucking dreadful <laughs> <laughs> he's not, you know, a, a young man throwing around kicks. He's all about precision. That one elbow blow is in the right place. That's it's years of Starfleet and Vulcan nerve training, that is. He just leans forward with his toupee and most of his force is carried with his toupee. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we take a moment to, uh, to, to appreciate the Shatner toupee in that film? Yeah, that's enough. Yeah. The shots is too big. He's probably still got it. (laughs) (laughs) It's voluminous. It's pretty good. It's nicely shampooed. Do you remember Michael Keaton's toupee for the first Batman? is is amazing, and he loved it, and he kept it. Is it toupee in Batman? Yeah. Is he bald? Michael Keaton, yeah. Is he? Wow. Is he? Yeah. Yeah. Never knew that. No, neither did I. Whenever I picture Michael Keaton, I just picture Billy Crystal. So I don't know. I don't know which one's which. <laughs> yeah, quite similar. Now you mention it. Love to see Billy Crystal in Batman. That would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do if you see a film starring both Michael Keaton and Billy Crystal? Is that really, like, really confusing? I can't keep track of who's who. <laughs> I just can't imagine. Yeah, it just goes... <laughs> Well, you're dressed like a clown. What are you supposed to be? Some kind of party entertainer? <laughs> <laughs> it is Michael Keaton in City Slickers, isn't it? No. <laughs> That's Billy Crystal. <laughs> but it's um, it's Michael Keaton in Monsters, Inc. I'm sure. Anybody else want to add anything else about anything else? Let me just check my notes. Moves distracting. Worms good. <laughs> STD. <laughs> Why is Khan's buddy wearing a waffle? I can't remember what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just put it out there, and if anyone can answer. I think we should put that out as a tweet, actually. Why is Khan's friend wearing a waffle? Anybody can answer this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd like to ask you, Craig, as well. Uh, what do you think of the running time of this movie? 
because you you a particular running time aficionado. I didn't pay that much attention to it, and it has been like three weeks since I watched it. Okay. But I think maybe it's how long is it? One hour fifty three minutes. Or oh, the director's cut is one hour fifty six minutes. Bloody hell! <laughs> well, I, I watched the director's cut then because mine was an hour fifty six. Wow. Yeah. The only thing I I can think that may have been added is there's quite a lot of blood when the earworm comes up. Yeah. Chekhov's ear. Is there a lot of blood in the vision? No, that's it. Yeah. I think what's been added is what I said before, which is them telling you that that crew member is Scotty's nephew because I didn't watch the director's cut. Oh, okay. I, I read I read that that had been cut out. So yeah. I think that's what you got. Oh, Captain James T. Kirk, this is me niece. <laughs> Won't you treat him well? <laughs> Scott, Scott Irish. just gone Irish. Irish. <laughs> oh, oh, Captain. I thought he was Irish. I thought it was an ironic nickname. <laughs> Actually, isn't that weird? Because he's called Scotty because that's his name, right? Yeah, Montgomery is, yeah. Scott. Yeah. Not because he's Scottish. Why didn't he just let him do his normal voice? Yeah. Probably would have been amazing. Showing his acting range, no doubt. <laughs> his magnificent range. <laughs> it was Gene Roddenberry's 60s idea of diversity. <laughs> gotta have gotta have a Scottish person in. <laughs> <laughs> Underrepresented. Maybe in his uh, in his audition, he goes, I can do uh, any accent. <laughs> just look at this dartboard. He's put uh, he's written Different accents in the segments of a dartboard. He goes, throw a dart. (laughs) Whichever one, I'll do. Straight into Scottish. (laughs) So, in the plot, despite protests from his crew and several opportunities to get away and start a new life, Khan is blinded by rage and his desire to prove to Kirk he's better than him. And this is ultimately his undoing, which is typical, these silly old villains. Can our panel come up with a convincing Khan victory and finish Kirk once and for all? First option, I'm going to pick the probably the most hostile anti-Star Trek person and the guy that I'd most like to pop on a red jumper and beam down to a planet, which is Ben. I think that's a real disservice to Gaz's hatred of, of this. <laughs> it just uh, Ben's is more visceral. Gaz is more, you know, brooding, sort of, that he's just hates it and he knows he hates it, but Ben wants to air it quite regularly. All right, so here we go. Immediately after hijacking the Starship Reliant, I would head to Earth or wherever Kirk is based at the beginning of the film. Then I'd ditch the quasi-Pocahontas get-up and get myself a nice figure-hugging smock something befitting my genetically engineered intellect. I'd also crop the mullet and lay low for a while. After a few months, I'd use my superior intellect to establish a new identity and ingratiate myself into society, slowly working my way up to a position of power, like a politician or something similar, something that would give me access to the, uh, the Starfleet brass. Then, one by one, I'd earwig those leaders to bring them under my control. With them nice and compliant, I'd get them to give Kirk ever more tiresome desk jobs. First, ship inspections. Then, writing the guidelines for ship inspections. (laughs) Then, overseeing periodic updates to the ship inspection (laughs) guidelines that he'd originally written. And then, you know, later just put him in charge of another set of guidelines. (laughs) Starfleet dress code, funeral protocols, you know, something like that. Thus beginning the cycle of tedium again. But at the same time, I'd have Starfleet Command promote Kirk's friends to exciting and fulfilling positions so that whenever they talk to Kirk, they tell him how great their lives are. Kirk and his mental health, meanwhile, would rapidly deteriorate until Kirk becomes as irrelevant and obsolete as the antiques he collects. Upon Kirk's inevitable retirement from Starfleet, I'd send him the following letter. Dearest James T. Kirk, you think you're so (laughs) smart, don't you? (laughs) Well, I have news for you. You aren't. All these years, you've been wasting your talents pushing pencils for Starfleet as your enthusiasm for life has drained from you like hot dog water from a pan. (laughs) Tedious task after tedious task, you blindly followed orders as I knew you would. Yes, it was I, Khan Noonien Singh, who orchestrated everything, each mind-numbing chore. You wasted your life, and now you'll have the isolation of your retirement to reflect on how I ruined your life as you did mine. Na, 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 na. 
Sincerely, Khan. Khan! I like that our plans are becoming increasingly kind of less physical, more psychological, and also quite quite twee than sweet as the weeks go on. <laughs> Is it Sorry. sweet? I took that from uh, Chris, from Christoph in the Truman Show. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to hurt someone, hurt them deep and in the mind. One question I have about it is, Khan's obviously got an insatiable rage and lust for revenge against Kirk. And do you think this sort of drip-fed, slowly but surely full revenge on Kirk is enough to sate his unquenchable thirst? Yes, Your Honour. <laughs> I think so. I think it's like he says, he says, um, you know, revenge is a dish best served cold, doesn't he? So. Mm. Isn't Kirk's whole thing that he's a guy that doesn't play by the rules? Mm, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, like I don't he, think he'd he, play by these rules. He loves guidelines. <laughs> he makes a decision to refuse to become promoted, doesn't he? To stay yeah. captain. So, yeah, I think he is. Uh, no, he doesn't because he. Because he's already promoted, he's doing the inspection in the film. That's how the film starts. Yeah, but he goes back to being captain in the series as it goes on. But he he, he chins off the inspection as well. They go, what about the rest of the inspection? Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't follow the rules. He's a maverick renegade. Once again, my lack of Star Trek knowledge has been my downfall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so many times in life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Craig, can we have uh, your plan, please? It was the best of plans. It was the worst of plans. It's evident that Khan spent the decade and a half of his exile on SETI Alpha 5 familiarising himself with the limited library, ironically developing a particular obsession with Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Khan comes to regard Kirk as his white whale, going so far as to quote Ahab during their duel. Supposedly hyper-intelligent, he obviously chose not to heed the moral of that particular story, but imagine if he'd given more focus to some of the other great novels on his shelf. The first most notable addition for the Trekkie is Milton's epic Paradise Lost. In Space Seed, Kirk likens Khan and his paramour Lieutenant McGivers to Adam and Eve, believing Seti Alpha 5 to be a perfect world for Khan to tame. Does Khan see Kirk as God? As Satan? Perhaps both. But in Paradise Lost, the Archangel Michael teaches Adam to seek paradise not without, but within. Could Khan have spent his exile finding inner peace? Or is he Satan? leading the rebellion against heaven. Perhaps the most inspiring volume on the shelf is Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. He may have felt a closer kinship with Dr. Manette, the French physician who was incarcerated in the Bastille for 18 years, a fellow genius in prison. With him as an example, Khan could have taken to obsessive study and practice of the art of shoemaking, fashioning footwear of superior comfort and quality for his colony of genetic supermen, and allowing a little light into their dreary lives. By the time he crossed paths with Chekhov, he could have had a cobbler's that would have been the envy of the Federation, with old foes like Kirk becoming valued customers, desperate to abandon the narrow leather Starfleet issue winkle pickers. Then, with a loyal base of customers, Khan could really prove that the old Klingon proverbs are the best. He could fashion a pair of shoes for Kirk, stylish and of undeniable quality. However, almost imperceptibly, the soul has an adverse camber, <laughs> causing Kirk to overpronate as he walks, leading to plantar fasciitis, <laughs> that's heel spurs, hallux valgus, that's bunions, <laughs> Achilles tendonitis, corns, calluses, and hammer toes, navicular <laughs> apophysitis, shin splints, and fractures in the first and second toes. As we are shown, Kirk is reluctant to turn to bones with his own medical woes, so he suffers in silence never able to ride a horse with Picard. You know the thing about hammer toes, don't you? No. You can't touch them. <laughs> hey! That might be your finest hour, Gareth. Basking no it. need for Basking my plan of one. Game over, man. Game over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I am going to make a note of that before you've even done your plot. I've got brownie points for joke. Yeah, I'll put that down. Seems fair. Yeah, yeah. Good joke. There you go. Yeah, very good. So, do you think that Khan, with his superior intellect, would would obviously he's again? It's one of these things. He's very slow, slow, long drawn out uh, revenge. 
Revenge is a dish best served cold. Ancient Klingon aphrodisiac. <laughs> All fine being cold, but they don't, you don't want it rotten and covered in mould. So, you know. But do you think being a shoemaker is a test of Khan's sort of higher... He wants to outwit Kirk. And by being a shoemaker... He is... He is outwitting him in a way because he's saying well you never expected your shoes to be made by your your, your nemesis did you and that for that nemesis to, to debilitate you essentially exactly right and it, it's uh it's what he doesn't see that gets him as we were saying of, of you know the the horror genre that's the thing my only issue with this plan craig and i, I like that it's it kind of goes below, below the radar but obviously looking at the way Khan dresses, the only thing he can make would be moccasins, which we all know are the com- most comfortable shoe of all time. Mm. And, and yeah, wool line as well. Ooh, a nice cosy wool lining. <laughs> That's because he spent 15 years obsessively reading Moby Dick and learning how to make clothes from Queequeg. <laughs> Queequeg. When he should have spent 15 years. <laughs> I take it you have not read Moby Dick. <laughs> no. He should have spent 15 years reading A Tale of Two Cities I and then he would have learned... <laughs> He is a good name. He would have learned the noble art of cobbling, mm-hmm. and he would have been able to make better shoes. That's that's the point I'm making. You know, they they tie the plot of this movie so closely to the fact that he's read Moby Dick, and the, the first thing you see before you even see his face is his bookshelf with Moby Dick on it. But it also has a tale of two cities on it, and Paradise Lost and Dante's Inferno. So, you know, does it have Puss in Boots? I, I didn't see it. <laughs> Maybe I like it. As someone who has had quite painful feet from wearing shit shoes all day in work, it works for me. <laughs> the first time I got some New Balance from uh, from Sports Direct, I was like, "Oh my god, I've been over pronating my whole life." And, <laughs> you know, it made everything feel good, top to toe. I also sympathise with how debilitating it can be having a, a foot injury. So yeah, and if you've seen Kirk's shoes in the original series, they are narrow as fuck. They come to a, like a proper point. Could Gareth and Craig be deducted points for having shit feet? <laughs> I don't have any feet issues. No, because I have foot issues as well, and it's, you're the odd one out. So you're actually you're you're having points deducted from you now, Ben, because that, having good feet. Yeah, it's <laughs> having like an anti foot fetish. So uh, yeah, you've lost. Um, I don't know how many points. I'll just make up a number later and tell you. It's like QI. You'll have to add uh, shit feet or good feet as categories to the top trumps cards. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. yeah. I'll get, it will have to be uh, like a, a picture of a foot with some smelly lines coming off it to symbolise how crap it is. Yeah. <laughs> right, Gaz, do you want to dazzle and uh, delight us with your plan? The river must cut the middleman here. Of course, the mediator is Chekhov, and the man is the finisher. <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> I thought I could get through this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's gone, he's going, he's going. He's going. <laughs> uh, for him to use the two ill-fated objects, he must destroy them and use their murders to trash Kirk and the boys on his planet. When the crew of the Enterprise stumble upon Khan's realm, they have to stab several bugs in the ears, such as Kirk, Spock and Vaughn. and turn them into zombie slaves wouldn't it be a more satisfying (laughs) more satisfying revenge if mexican slash indian friends (laughs) i I don't think we're gonna be able to get through this (laughs) if this wins i'm not doing another one Why, why didn't we talk about that, by the way? Why is a Mexican playing an Indian? And then later on, why is Benedict Cumberbatch playing him? fucking sense. Meant to be a Sikh. Okay. It says, Kirk, now make universe hot pot noodles. Add soy sauce. <laughs> Changing the channel, the coronation starts in five minutes, Boone said. <laughs> Using your medical skills. Have you had a stroke this week? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god using your medical skills you slowly plunged the knife into kirk's arm and he was bleeding khan was able to quickly release his anger but it had been locked away for years so the best revenge was this have to do justice with legion money for months 
I think it's just playing and even a year. <laughs> <laughs> and like pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike pasta, revenge is better than cold food. <laughs> <laughs> but I added the last one. There is an old Klingon proverb that says, <laughs> "He's not going to be able to say it. He's not going to be able to say it. <laughs> He's not going to be able to say it." <laughs> oh, <sure. laughs> Can we just put a transcript of this it's in the notes for people that want to know what's going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. this will be definitely required for this regardless anyway because I'm fucking lost <laughs> can't wait to hear you sum this up there is an old Klingon proverb that says odd Mazdata is better than ice cream unlike pasta <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? It's just been written by an AI because that's what I'm getting from. I'm getting to that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god! Oh man! Oh, I know what you've done. I know what you've done. I do. (laughs) Go on. Written in English, translated as Klingon, (laughs) then translated back. Yes, exactly. Close, close. It didn't work in Klingon. I tried it. So what I've done is it's gone from English to Welsh to Spanish to Swahili to Japanese back to English to (laughs) Slovak to Icelandic to Macedonian to Korean to Urdu and back to English. It's the random stuff it's changed, like bones being changed to boon and stuff like that. (laughs) I think it's amazing. Spock to spoke. (laughs) Yeah. And the Klingon proverb is mental. (laughs) Old man's data is better than ice cream. (laughs) And like pasta. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So, no, I think think you can leave it at that. (laughs) Did you understand what the plan was, though? (laughs) Because there is a a real plan. (laughs) What's the gist of it? When Kirk and everyone go down to the planet, uh, instead of trying to trap them there, he should earwear them all and keep Kirk as his slave for the rest of his life, is the plan. Okay. Because revenge is a dish better served cold. And like, like pasta. pasta and ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Odd Mazdata. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, three very, very distinctive individual plans there, and none of them crossing boundaries, I would say. So in summation, Ben said, Khan, go back to Earth, incognito, an earwig or a Starfleet, to bore Kirk to death with tedious jobs and to drive him into the ground mentally that way. And then write a, a nice letter to him on his retirement. Yeah, and and write a nice revenge letter to say, no, 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 no. Yeah, where you really... Put salt in the wound. <laughs> really rub it in deep. <laughs> Craig took inspiration from Charles Dickens and said Khan would become a shoemaker to eventually inflict debilitating foot injuries, ultimately crippling Kirk, making his life a misery, which three of, of us can certainly appreciate is a dastardly diabolical scheme in itself. And then Gaz, well... <laughs> <laughs> So Gaz's plan was to earwig Kirk himself and to keep Kirk as his slave and keep him on the planet there. And obviously he had a, a very convoluted uh, multilingual plot, which I'm sure most of us found incredible. Um, but there can only be one winner, and it's a very tough decision. It, re- it really is. It's really tough. But this week's winner is Craig for his terrible uh, foot injury to Carl. Huzzah. Well done. Well done. Uh, yeah, it was ink. That was, I really genuinely torn and I and I had to put my myself in there. And You literally put yourself in Kirk's painful shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, I think that's what, that kind of threw it for me. And I thought, it, you know, and learning a, a trade to become a shoemaker must be incredibly satisfying as well. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Are you having to go um, uh, cobblers now? Daniel yeah. Day Lewis. Are you fucking Daniel Day Lewis in me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Craig, as uh, this week's winner, what is your pick of the film next week? Please. We're going to watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Very good. 
<laughs> I like that because neither Billy Crystal nor uh, Michael Keaton are in it, so so I'm not confused. <laughs> Don't Billy Crystal and Michael Keaton play Mario and Luigi in the Super Mario Brothers movie? I think they might do, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think they both play Smee, alternately, and Hook as well. <laughs> You know, like when you have little kids and they can't act for too long, so you get like twins or triplets. <laughs> That's their shtick in their audition. Michael Keaton comes in and goes, you sign me and you get him. And he points with the thumb and then in through the door pops uh, Billy Crystal. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed yourselves as much as we did. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Don't forget to tell your friends in person and on social media. It helps us out massively. We can follow us across social media and YouTube. Just search for at DiabolicalPod. Until the next time, I have and always will be yours. <laughs>